some research that's remaining, and I have a, a an addiction clinic at Stanford uh, as well that's starting up. So, um, so that's a little bit about myself. Um, my interest is in tobacco, and um, kind of always has been. I work with the American Psychiatric Association on their um, addiction council. I'm a council counselor. I've been counselor for uh, several years now, six, seven years. Um, and we have a tobacco work group, so I'll be referencing some of the work there. Uh, and then a lot of the slides that I'm presenting, well, if you're going to see Sam, you're going to see a very similar talk. Um, but the other thing about the slides is they're, um, they're meant to be used over and over and over again. Um, and so there are arcs for change.ucsf.edu. I'll flash the, um, the website at the end there because um, that it was part of a grant to try to get tobacco training out there um, and to get tobacco training and treatment, especially into mental health settings. Okay, so things that we're gonna go over, um, financial disclosures, um, I have equity in the company that I've joined called Lyra Health, um, but it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I've been working on this uh, tobacco work for long before I joined them. Um, and we'll talk about why this is important. I'll do a little bit of a detour on e-cigarettes, um, and then the five A's approach to tobacco use disorders and pharmacotherapy, and this is doing that annoying thing where it automatically switches. Let me just Okay, so um, so why is this important? Um, and this is especially relevant to addiction psychiatry as well as anybody working in substance use disorders. So people with mental illness and substance use disorders have uh, double the rate, if not more, um, of smoking. So we see a lot more smoking in patients with mental illness, um, and I imagine all of you who work with patients here at Fort Miley, it's very common to uh, encounter smoking uh, on the problem list. Um, the most recent statistics, unfortunately, this has not been, uh, they ha there hasn't been a study like this since, but half the cigarettes are sold in the US, and they account for nearly half of the 500,000 premature deaths annually. So, Smoking is still the leading preventable cause of death in this country. It's one of those things that's kind of fallen by the wayside in terms of popularity, like, and especially here in California, um, it, although San Francisco is a little bit of a pocket where there's more, a little bit more smoking. Um, but in California, we tend not to think about smoking as something that is still a major issue. And, and nationally, there's obviously a lot of attention to the opioid um, uh, prescription problem and also o overdose deaths. But if you take, you know, 30 to 40,000 overdose deaths in a year versus the nearly 500,000 premature deaths um, due to tobacco, there's still a big difference there. So it is still very much a problem. There's also a statistic that floats around mental health communities that people with mental illness and substance use disorders die on average 25 years early. And that's primarily due to the increased burden of tobacco use in this population, in these populations. Um, and then something that I always like to highlight, um, I'm gonna uh, give this very similar talk at CSAM, um, where I think it's, it's very relevant to say that uh, smoking accounts for more morbidity and mortality than alcohol and all other drugs combined. So I'm guilty of this, you know, having the patient come in, sitting right over there in, in building one, seeing somebody refilling their Suboxone and forgetting to ask about tobacco. Um, and uh, it's something, and, and, and I'll have all the signs, you know, they, they've got the little uh, box in their, in their shirt pocket or they smell of smoke. And, and regardless, even if I didn't have the signs, I should still ask about it because the opioid use disorder in that case is important or the methamphetamine use disorder or so on, but the tobacco is often what will end up leading to somebody being hospitalized or dying. Um, Smoking can also be um, uh, very costly for our patients, as we know. Um, cigarette packs, it's fun to sometimes ask our patients, how much are you paying for that pack of cigarettes? Especially in uh, a city like San Francisco, the taxes are pretty high, so oftentimes you'll get answers on seven to eight dollars, which is you know a decent chunk of change um, to be spending every single day. I'll uh, refer to a website later where you can do some of the math calculation with a patient and talk about you know, what they would do with that money if they had it. And a lot of people still smoke their cigarettes while alone. Um, is, there, is there still a smoking shack here? Okay, so um, you know, it can isolate folks. In Palo Alto, there's still a smoking shack, although I think the plan was to, by November, go completely smoke-free. Um, and you, know, you kind of have everybody 
huddled into this small, small place and, and smoke together. Um, and so it can be isolating. There's also a lot of stigma associated with smoking. Um, not just that, yeah, there's a lot of drug interactions. And these aren't just theoretical drug interactions. And I always like to share the example that I remember from residency because it really hit me, um, it, it, it affected me personally. Um, so caffeine uh, is a good one. I'll come back to that in a moment. But clozapine, in my clozapine clinic at the Menlo Park VA, um, I had a patient who was doing really well, um, kind of chronically uh, had, uh, was psychotic, had schizophrenia, but uh, overall uh, functioned well, was a greeter at the Palo Alto Hospital, um, and was just a very sweet and endearing uh, gentleman. Um, I didn't ask about smoking at our every clos every monthly clozapine visit, and he ended up going back to smoking. Um, and ended up smoking over a pack a day. Because he was smoking that much, his clozapine levels dropped. And so we, we found that out by doing labs. Um, and also because he became very acutely psychotic and suicidal. Um, so he was pleasantly living as the son of God and, and saying hello to everybody as they entered the VA. And then his clozapine levels dropped. And then suddenly he was responsible as a son of God for every person's death that happened at the VA and, and was very disturbed by that. And he got hospitalized for months. Um, so this is a very real uh, uh, drug interaction. Caffeine is also important because if somebody quits smoking, um, then ultimately their caffeine levels go up. So a lot of our patients will, you know, and if they're in an IOP, for example, they'll drink like six to eight cups of coffee a day, right? And so they stop, they stop smoking, that six to eight cups of coffee is like a whole lot more caffeine that's effectively in their systems. Um, and so you get withdrawal from smoking, but then you also feel even worse because you're having caffeine overload at that point. Um, so this sheet that's, uh, dis it's funny that everything's blue. This sheet that's uh, displayed up here is um, uh, available on the Rx for Change website. And so you can download it and it's just a quick reference of, um, of medication interactions. Tobacco use is associated with greater AMA uh, rates. Um, is smoking still allowed on the inpatient unit? Do they keep no, okay, so people can't go out for their smoke breaks. Okay, um, so um, uh, there was a time where, you know, people would kind of just stand around that, um, kind of the glass window that's there where all those cigarettes were kept in a basket, I remember, and um, kind of wait for that time uh, of the break. But um, if somebody is hospitalized and they're not given um, nicotine replacement, so somebody who's a smoker who's not given nicotine replacement is, a, is the most blue bar, um, they are more likely to leave against medical advice and, and end up with kind of the unwanted consequences of um, that can some unwanted effects that sometimes happen in inpatient hospitalizations. Um, particularly with psychiatric populations, we're going to focus in on um, the, oops, the, some of these social uh, things that led lead, led to higher rates of um, of smoking. So enabling environments. Um, this is uh, a uh, cover of a book by a UCSF professor from 1951, um, and in it it says um, uh, on page 39. Should the therapist smoke during the interview? Why not? It'll help drain the small amount of undischarged tension, which is always present during an interview, and it contributes to the naturalness of his behavior. Uh, so many things wrong with this, um, and, uh, and kind of what I'll point out most is that smoking was a part of the culture, um, unfortunately. Uh, the self-medication hypothesis. So a lot of people tried to say, a lot of people namely being the uh, tobacco industry at first, so this is, um, the, these are uh, images that come from the uh, the legacy website at UCSF. I think it's called um, the Truth Initiative at UCSF now. Um, but they're tobacco industry images. So this is R.J. Reynolds, and basically they are trying to put out studies to uh, to show that smoking is uh, use is useful as a coping mechanism in psychiatric populations. And I'll talk a little bit about how it's not self medicating anxiety or depression, it's self-medicating tobacco, nicotine withdrawal, essentially. Marketing, um, 
This one is uh, always interesting to uh, talk about here in San Francisco. So R.J. Reynolds again. Um, this is a PowerPoint slide from 1995. So it's not like this is super historic. 1995 isn't that long ago. Um, but they had subculture urban marketing campaign for gay people in the Castro and street people in the Tenderloin. These are quotes directly from their, um, from their slide deck. And so they called it Project Scum. Um, and they were trying to capitalize on marketing tobacco and cigarettes to, um, to these populations. Uh, they had to change the name of the campaign to Project Sourdough uh, because Project Scum obviously doesn't sound very good, but, um, but really targeted marketing towards disadvantaged populations. Um, this is uh, a letter from uh, on NIMH letterhead. Uh, 1980, again, not that long ago, uh, requesting, this is from a hospital, requesting a donation of cigarettes um, to uh, this hospital, 5,000 cigarettes, um, eight per day for each of the 100 patients without funds. So, and for those of us who have seen, um, I think it's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, right? Another Menlo Park VA uh, legacy, uh, you know, that smoke break and, and cigarettes are current, were currency and they were, they were brought into a lot of these settings. Um, and then it was a patient's rights issue. So um, uh, NAMI, which a lot of us turn to to refer our patients and families to as a partner, um, uh, the tobacco companies targeted them and said, you know, it's not fair. Once uh, Jayco put in smoking bans in the 90s, um, you know, this is a violation of your family members and, and psychiatric patients' um, rights to right to smoke. So all these lawsuits happen, and that's why. Uh, there was some lag in having psychiatric hospitals go completely smoke free and as I mentioned even um, as recently as being a fellow here there were still smoke breaks at, um, at the the unit here at the VA um, and we're still not there uh, so in 2011 that's where the last um, uh, data come from uh, there was still we still had about 20% of state psychiatric hospitals not be smoke free um, luckily, there is uh, there the inpatient facilities are more likely to have offered um, smoking cessation. I'm excited about this data coming out. Hopefully, again um, in the next several years, where we'll see hopefully more smoking cessation um, services offered. But our rates of offering smoking cessation are just uh, or smoking cessation treatment are are very very low. Um, and then for psychiatrists in particular, um, and the last AMC uh, American Association of Medical Colleges survey was done in 2007 of all the um, of all the specialties, but psychiatrists were least likely to address tobacco out of all the uh, specialties. So we have the highest burden of tobacco in psychiatry compared to all the other medical specialties, and yet we're least likely to address it. Um, a lot of people may say, well, that's because my patients with mental illness don't want to quit. That is not true. Um, compared to the general population, people in mental health settings uh, are just as likely to want to quit, um, if not more likely to want to quit. So it's not that people don't want to quit. They oftentimes have a harder time quitting uh, because their dependence is, is often uh, stronger for a variety of reasons. But um, they're also not being offered the opportunity to quit. Um, and, and in the AMC survey, you know, there's, there's more immediate things I need to address. Um, you know, I, I have this much time. And then at the same time, primary care often only gets 15 minutes with their patients compared to um, the, the generous 30 minutes that we might have with some of our patients. Um, so, um, so, you know, this is one of those things that has been pushed to the wayside um, because it does feel like often there is something else going on. But if we, uh, what I'm gonna argue for is that if we just ask about it, simply asking and um, asking, not just as a checkbox, but just asking uh, and listening to the answer is important um, in helping improving outcomes. Um, some people will say also that there's worsening of clinical symptoms when we try to, uh, to help uh, get people to quit smoking, that is not true. Um, initially, someone may seem like, again, they're exhibiting worsening of symptoms, but that's because it's withdrawal, and we'll talk about withdrawal and the, and the neurotransmitters in a moment. Um, but basically, across the board, when it comes to psychiatric symptoms, as well as other substance use disorders, there's improved outcomes when somebody quits smoking. Um, and what's one I'm going to skip over? 
so I was just saying that it's important to uh, to bring this up um, and then um, both the uh, kind of having any clinician speak to smoking cessation as well as the number of times they speak to it um, helps improve quit rates so um, abstinence for smoking cessation gold standard gold gold standard is 12 months but six months is is fine in the research um, so we see that uh, it's helpful to have somebody tell you to quit smoking and it is also oh, this slide came up twice here okay so uh, the other slide which I think I have later is the number of times that you ask somebody to um, uh, about their smoking also improves the outcomes so just because you asked last time doesn't mean you shouldn't ask this time. So e-cigarettes. Um, so e-cigarettes are newer. Um, they uh, are supposed to be regulated, although uh, when you know I was able to add this bullet point in 2016, the amount of regulation really hasn't changed just because it's a huge, um, it's a huge industry and it's hard to regulate something that's this big. So what are e-cigarettes? At this point, I think most of us are pretty familiar with what an e-cigarette is, but I will uh, still go over it. So um, they're oftentimes similar in appearance to cigarettes, although a lot of people now have these, um, uh, these cartridges that they can refill with other uh, solutions. Um, there's many names for e-cigarettes. Uh, they have a rechargeable or disposable battery. Um, you know, there's, there's some that you can just plug into the, the USB drive to, to recharge it. The liquid solution has a number of chemicals, um, some of which can be harmful to uh, the lungs, um, and especially some of the flavorings, um, such as like popcorn flavor, uh, can also be harmful. They also increase the amount that somebody wants to use them. So um, a lot of kind of buzz and addiction is about sugar and, and the reinforcing effects of sugar and sweetness. And so, um, you know, Juul has some, and I'm not just singling out Juul, it's just uh, at the last um, tobacco workshop I did at the American Psychiatric Association, there was somebody who was like sitting right up front and was there really early. And then we came to find out that she was from Juul, a researcher from Juul. And, um, and so anyway, we started talking a lot about their, uh, their flavorings, but uh, they have limited fav flavorings, which is good, but the limited flavorings include creme brulee, um, which can be reinforcing um, from a sugar point of view or sweetness point of view. Um, and then there's modifications. Um, one of the things that's concerning that I'll talk about is uh, using cannabis or canna uh, uh, putting in cannabis oils into these um, products. So the amount of nicotine is certainly less than with a traditional cigarette, although technology is improving to, to deliver more nicotine. Um, and there's like a, there's a trade-off in this, so the uh, just like Big Tobacco did a lot of uh, research and and um, and uh, improvements in in how well a cigarette functions. Um, the e-cigarette companies are doing the same. Um, however, uh, we don't know what's in these cartridges. Um, so again, it's still unregulated. They're still not uh, what's listed on the label isn't necessarily what we have in the cartridges themselves. Luckily, in the studies that are starting, uh, that have um, that are underway looking at e-cigarettes, those are more regulated and they're more reliable. Um, so hopefully we can learn about them. So um, e-cigarettes, uh, the use is taking off um, in, among kids and adults. Um, more used by people with mental health conditions um, and there's more dual use in people with mental illness so um, a lot of us have the patient that comes in and says you know I want to quit smoking with an e-cigarette um, and uh, and I'm getting to the punchline early and, and I think it's okay to support them in that um, and that's in part from a um, American Heart Association statement um, but kind of cautioning two things one is don't use your e-cigarette and smoke cigarettes at the same time because ultimately you'll end up just using more of both. Um, and then two, set a quit date for the e-cigarette. Um, so anytime anyone wants to come in, comes in and wants to quit smoking, I'm like, yes, that's awesome. Let's take advantage of that. Um, but I also don't want you to just end up smoking more or using your e-cigarette more in addition to the traditional cigarettes. Um, uh, this is looking again at mental health. So in um, 
people with, oh, the colors are gonna be horrible here. Um, so in people, uh, this is mental health condition, and this is, this is no mental health condition. Um, and in people uh, who have mental health conditions, again, we have higher rates of ever use and also current use. For youth, um, oops, okay, so past month e-cigarette use has tripled, um, and this was just from 2013 to 2014. Um, more people are starting to use regular, more kids are starting to use regular cigarettes after using e-cigarettes. Um, one fifth of e-cigarette uh, using adolescents uses it to smoke cannabis oil. And there's always the, the nicotine gateway hypothesis um, and that nicotine initiating use of nicotine in early years um, can be associated with use of other drugs later in life, including regular cigarettes. Um, and then they're also, it's also very normalizing. And this is just kind of like a social thing, you know, I, um, there's, uh, you see people using these everywhere, right? Like they're just, they're kind of becoming part of community, um, although not in San Francisco now. Um, but uh, they're, because they're becoming kind of more present and people are using them um, and saying, oh, they're quitting smoking, it's, it's making them look like they're, um, they're not as bad. Um, and you know it's kind of similar to what we're seeing oftentimes with cannabis these days. So, um, so e-cigarettes are being are more accepted, and obviously it's it is less less um, less socially isolating and less socially mm -hmm. taboo than walking by somebody and smoking a cigarette. It, you know you're not going to get uh, as many looks as if you if you're using an e-cigarette. So health risks. Um, as I mentioned, there's chemicals in them um, that can cause pulmonary injury. Um, there uh, is a very recent study that uh, looks at lung uh, injury with e-cigarettes and, and basically, again, tells repeats what we've been saying all along is that we're worried about e-cigarettes causing um, lung damage, and that was more in uh, adolescents. Um, nicotine is very addictive. Um, and so it's, you know, it doesn't come without, uh, without its risks. The oftentimes a question I get after this is, well, if nicotine's so addictive, then when we talk about nicotine replacement therapy, why is that okay? Um, and it's a method of delivery. The e-cigarette is highly reinforcing. It, um, it does allow us to, uh, to, to feel like we're using a cigarette um, and, and the rate at which the nicotine is delivered um, to the brain is uh, faster than with nicotine replacement generally. Question? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to skip this? Just no, go for it. Okay. On page 7, recently told me about dripping. Um, have you heard of this? I have not heard of dripping. Okay, so. That'll do so it. I was wondering, like, um, what brought this up for me with like the cannabis use with these, and I'm just wondering, like, what percentage of like adolescents specifically are using this, like, in a way, but not even the, you know, not even like dual intended. Yeah, that's a good question. I I don't know that. Um, I don't know of any research right now at looking at uh, maladaptive use of dual. There's enough research on just the regular use of Juul yeah. that's concerning. Um, but yeah, that's, I'll have to look up dripping. I haven't heard of anybody saying that they're dripping. Uh, learned something new, that's awesome. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's, as I mentioned, there's, we don't know that they're safe. We still need to be worried about them. Um, there was a study that came out in New England Journal in January of this year that um, uh, a lot of us probably saw that there were 886 smokers randomized to e-cigarettes or nicotine replacement, and you know, looking at 18% year one-year abstinence versus 10% was significantly different. Um, if you read that study carefully, there's um, yeah, there's a lot of things that are are interesting. One is that. Um, people don't necessarily use nicotine replacement the way that they should. And that's where we can be very effective in helping to support them and educate them about how to use nicotine replacement therapy. So um, 
the number of people that actually stuck to nicotine replacement therapy was much lower than the number of pe- than the proportion of people that um, that kept using the e-cigarette on a daily basis. So um, the the number of people, the proportion of people that w- were using nicotine replacement therapy was, um, I believe, it was less than a third um, daily uh, compared to uh, compared to the e-cigarettes. So it was just easier for people to use the e-cigarettes. They wanted to use the e-cigarettes. Also, it's novel. They've tried the nicotine replacement therapy in the past, and it didn't work. So why would it work this time? Here's this new fancy device that they get to use. And so there, you know, I have concerns about this being generalized to saying that all e-cigarette that e-cigarettes should be widely used for smoking cessation, especially because it kind of uh, our patients are looking for something like they've they've suffered a whole lot. This has been something uh, smoking cessation has been something oftentimes that they've tried and tried and tried again. So they want something that works, and so um, for many that means that they when they they get light of something like this or uh, hear about something like this, it means they go and grab kind of whatever product they can they can get. Um, whereas this was a study with a study device and so on. Um, so, so I think the, the jury's still out. Obviously, we can all agree that there's less, um, there's less uh, harm that comes from e-cigarettes. The combustible tobacco puts smoke into our lungs and our bodies and has a whole bunch of carcinogenic effects that are, are, le- are more than with an e-cigarette, but, um, but we still don't have um, evidence that they're totally safe. And it's a harm reduction sort of thing. Yeah. So I didn't read that study, but in that meta-analysis, they um, is there any dose dependency or a patch of history of like are lighter smokers more likely to quit versus you know long term or are lighter smokers more likely? Right, because I mean, I mean, if you go back to study, yeah. I mean, obviously not all smokers are the same. So are, was there a huge stratification of light, heavy, or or? No, there was no stratification. It was just all, yeah, they needed to um, have smoked at least 10 cigarettes, I believe, was the number. But, um, yeah, I mean, could could a lighter smoker quit with an e-cigarette? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking in terms of... Yeah. On the other hand, could a lighter smoker just use nicotine replacement and get off uh, and instead of transitioning to another another product that we still don't know too much about? But, yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. And the outcomes in the studies are the use of Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, that's what we're trying to reduce is is uh, traditional cigarettes because they're so harmful. Um, but uh, you know, we want to make sure that we do that in a smart way, and we have FDA proven, evidence based uh, methods that are underutilized. So I already kind of uh, gave away that the, the American Heart Association um, has a good policy statement on e-cigarettes. Um, that you know you can ask somebody to quit smoking um, uh, the traditional cigarettes if they're trying to use the e-cigarette to quit to quit smoking and then also have a um, have a quit date for the e-cigarettes all right um, in the interest of time I'm going to keep moving on so as I mentioned arts for change at UCSF.edu it's a no-cost uh, training tool for improving uh, tobacco treatment and psychiatric care um, it relies on the clinical practice guidelines that came out in 2000 and updated in 2008. Um, cigarette uh, treating tobacco has not, you know, changed. The only thing that continues that we can work on uh, is, uh, aside from the whole e-cigarette question, um, is that we can increase the amount that we actually do treat tobacco. So this uses the five a- A's model, um, which can be used for other substance use disorders. Um, I don't, you know, some people like this 5A, some people like having some other method. I don't care what we use as long as we use something um, and and remember treating tobacco. Um, and so um, ask, advise, assess, assist, arrange. Uh, it's just a cutesy way of, of doing it. Um, there, uh, one thing to remember is to that tobacco use disorder is a DSM-5 substance use disorder, just like all the other substances that we're asking about in our visits. Um, and so it's got the same criteria, basically, and so it's very easy to um, document whether or not somebody meets DSM criteria for mild, moderate, um, severe uh, use disorder. So we ask about use in a non-judgmental way. Um, and in a, in a setting like the VA, for example, um, 
it's very easy to, I think it's easier to do that because a lot of our patients do smoke. So it's, you know, you just ask about when their last cigarette was often. Yes. I'll also come to that. Okay. You sure? Yeah. I guess <laughs> something I've been coming up with yeah. is like thinking about the DSM criteria for tobacco use disorder. Like there's a lot of patients who smoke. Would you make the argument that all patients probably have a tobacco use disorder that smoke? If they smoke regularly, they likely do meet some of that criteria, right? Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about it, most people that use tobacco would at least have a mild use disorder. Generally, yeah. yeah. But then when you start thinking about this clinically significant impairment or distress piece, mm -hmm. and then I wonder about it. If you took away their cigarettes from them, would they have distress? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, most patients I guess, well, no, I can't say that. Um, most of the people that we come across who use heroin here and there oftentimes have an opioid use disorder. So um, I would argue that there is the distress piece of it, um, even with tobacco. That just means that a lot of our patients have tobacco use disorder, and so there's a lot that we can do. Um, so asking in a non-judgmental way um, is, is helpful. I don't like to make people feel bad about it. Um, so even with any substance, you know, these days, for example, in the VA, I would ask, you know, when was the last time you used cannabis? Because again, it's very, uh, it's so many patients do it that um, when we ask about drug use, they, they oftentimes forget to mention cannabis and tobacco. This is where um, the five A's kind of uh, departs a little bit from like traditional MI sort of uh, training, right? You kind of see where people are at and then you give them the advice or you don't give them advice because we're not advice givers, we lead patients through their journey. In the case of tobacco, no, um, I would say that it, it, because the evidence is compelling that advising um, ends up coming out with uh, good outcomes in the research, but also because the health effects are so strong for tobacco that just letting them know, and oftentimes they do know, um, that, uh, that quitting smoking can help them in their other health outcomes, including their substance use disorder, the other, whatever other disorder they have. Um, mm -hmm. So if the patient uses tobacco and they're ready to qu uh, not ready to quit, then uh, when you ask, then you, um, you do MI. If they are ready to quit, you can go through the whole five A's. Um, if they don't use tobacco and they've quit, then um, be excited for that. Um, and if they've never started smoking, then especially again in the veteran population where um, sometimes veterans who are in substance use disorder treatment can pick up smoking later, just encourage the continued abstinence. Um, MI-wise, uh, this, um, this is still from the same clinical practice guideline. It's a slightly dated version of MI, but you know, really tailor the, um, the message to the patient so that it feels relevant for them. All right, so um, parts of the history, just like with any substance use, we would wanna know what they use, um, when they've tried to quit in the past, what's worked for them, uh, what hasn't worked for them, uh, and then address key issues like stress, triggers, weight, social support. So patients will come in and say, um, you know, I gain weight every time I quit smoking and I don't sugarcoat that I say yes. Generally, people will gain five to 10 pounds, but we have to figure out, you know, weigh the risks and benefits of continuing to smoke and gaining that extra weight versus, you know, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, quitting smoking and gaining that extra weight versus continuing to smoke and all the different effects that you have on your health. Um, so um, the uh, on the Rx for Change website, there's actually handouts for patients that you can just print out and give them and go over with them that talk about how to deal with some of these um, these key issues that come up psychosocially. It's really important to set a quit date, even if they don't make that quit date. You set it and then you move it and then you set it and then you move it. And I've done this many times for many patients and then eventually a quit will stick. Um, so just like with any other chronic disease, it oftentimes takes multiple tries and it doesn't always happen in the first time. Um, a slip versus a relapse. Um, so some of this terminology is, is controversial, you know, should we call it a slip? 
But um, the reason I like slip is because I use a very literal uh, analogy that I learned um, when I was when I first started doing uh, relapse prevention, which was you're walking along the street, you slip and you fall. You don't stay down there, you get right back up and you keep walking, right? So if somebody finds themselves smoking a cigarette or taking a puff of a cigarette, for a lot of people, this is very automatic. You know, they're in a situation, they have access to a cigarette, if some, even if it's not theirs, they oftentimes would get it from that friend at the bus stop and they find themselves smoking the cigarette. It doesn't mean they have to keep smoking that cigarette or in some cases keep smoking that whole pack of cigarettes just because they bought it. Um, it they, can, they can put it out and they can just continue with their, with their quit attempt. And then congratulate the patient. Just be really excited for them because this is huge. Um, this is, uh, you know, I, I'm made fun of because of how much I highlight smoking cessation in notes. Um, I will like write, you know, continue some buprenorphine, you know, whatever, 18 milligrams and has been not used heroin in three years. And then in like all caps, but like wants to quit smoking, address this, make sure we keep this as part of our, our conversation because it is a big, um, a big step for many people. As I mentioned, the number of times we see people helps increase the quit rate. Um, and so um, oftentimes if we're seeing folks regularly um, in the VA, for example, uh, oftentimes we have the, the ability to see them either monthly or weekly or whatever, um, just bringing it up and just checking in about it. If you don't have time to do all that, you can ask, advise, and refer. Um, and uh, the VA has the telequit, um, or at least they did have it here. Do they still have a consult here for the, the telequit service? Okay, all right. Um, so, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this because the, um, the outcomes are decent also with ask, advise, refer. But letting them know that you as their treatment provider, you value this, it's important to you and you're putting in the consult um, makes it even more important to them. This is a good website, the No Butts website for California. Um, so if you're outside of the VA system, it has a lot of resources. I mentioned earlier this um, little slider you can do with patients. How much money will you save by quitting smoking? Um, and it's sometimes fun to just see, you know, if you're paying six bucks for a pack of cigarettes and you're having one pack of cigarettes a day and you were smoking for three years, well then you've spent $6,500 on, on cigarettes. Um, uh, and for most people, you know, three years is, is kind of a low, uh, a low, low number for a, a veteran um, and how long they've been smoking. So you can um, really talk about what could they do if, you know, they quit and their 10 year cost would have been $21,000. Um, and then as I mentioned, the Rx for Change website has a lot of um, handouts and this is a five A's in just a short handout form. I'm going to talk about medications. I know not everyone here um, uh, will be uh, will be recommending medications regularly, but I think especially since a lot of them are over the counter um, and don't need prescriptions, it's good for us to have an awareness of the medications. So we should always take every opportunity to try to um, to give somebody a pharmacologic aid to quit smoking. If they're interested in quitting smoking, we want to give them all that we can. Um, and so, um, so we shouldn't skimp out on this. Medications significantly improve quit success rates. Um, so as I mentioned, when somebody takes a puff of a cigarette, it gets to the brain very quickly. Uh, nicotine reaches the brain within 11 seconds. That's highly reinforcing, right? When you think about what makes something addictive, nicotine is one of those things that's very, very satisfying. Um, and what ends up happening is somebody wakes up, their nicotine's very low, they smoke, they get into this pleasure zone of having the high nicotine, and then they come down. So um, again, a very reinforcing substance is something that goes up and comes down and then you want it again, right? So you want it again. And uh, tobacco companies looked at this and they realized that 20 cigarettes is a good amount to put in to make this cycle happen 20 times within a day. Um, and then somebody goes to sleep and then when they wake up in the morning, they're back down here again and they feel low. So smokers, um, uh, they want to have be in that nice zone. Um, and then they can also uh, self-tritrate nicotine by smoking more intensely um, on light, light cigarettes. Um, uh, people with um, substance use, uh, mental illness rather, have been known to, um, in studies, they're more likely to cover up the little vents that make the cigarettes light so that the, there's a, um, they get more of a high from the nicotine. 
um, and also breathe in uh, kind of more intensely. All right, so these are all the, um, all the neurotransmitters that are affected by nicotine, and they're all the same ones that we find in um, mood. Uh, so dopamine, pleasure and reward, uh, serotonin, mood modulation, appetite suppression. And so what happens is when somebody's smoking, they, they're like, well, it helps me think. I, you know, I, I, I feel less tense. And, and those things all happen temporarily, and then they stop because, again, the nicotine goes up and down. Um, and then when somebody stops smoking, they feel all of these horrible things, which are oftentimes why, um, why the self-medication hypothesis lives, right? So you, you're gonna withdraw from nicotine, you're gonna feel, you're gonna, so a patient's gonna seem like they're depressed or they're irritable or they have anxiety. These are all the things that we treat. Um, so nicotine withdrawal mimics a lot of psychiatric disorders. Luckily, I give, try to give people hope and I say, you know, one to two days this is going to be the worst and then after two to four weeks, it's going to get better. So just hang on with me for two to four weeks for the physiologic effects. I in no way try to make it seem like the um, kind of the behavioral uh, associations that they have with smoking will go away in that time. Those generally take a, a, about a year to subside. So as I mentioned, as I mentioned, there's seven FDA-approved uh, treatments, so we don't necessarily have to go to e-cigarettes because chances are not um, everybody has tried all of these, and if they've tried them, they also may not have used them correctly. So we'll talk about them. So nicotine replacement therapy, it helps so that you don't have the physical withdrawal from the nicotine. And there's two ways to do this. Um, one is to um, give steady nicotine with the patch, and then the other way is with the gum and the lozenge and the other um, nicotine replacements kind of fill in for those times where you have a craving. Nicotine replacement doubles quit rates. So it's not, you know, they're, they are very effective. So as I mentioned, cigarettes, they peak and then they come down in the nicotine and the patch offers that steady nicotine and then the other forms of nicotine replacement kind of offer a little bit more nicotine in that moment, um, but again, not as reinforcing as a cigarette. Can you just point out yeah. which one is the inhaler on that? Yeah. Uh, so the I've been wondering whether the, like, the inhaler would actually mimic. Here, this, okay. this one here is the inhaler, apparently we're plugging the color. I think that's it, yeah. Um, and this is a great place to practice using the inhaler because veterans can get it, or, uh, whereas in kind of other systems, it's a little harder to get the inhaler. And the inhaler's ever been studied on this, like, yeah. transplant or not? It's being studied, um, that, and then the Nicovax, um, uh, but uh, just mm. still not as promising as what we already have on the market here. Um, well, you don't have to take it every day. I mean, even your inhaler or else. Right, you, you have, have to, to take regular, yeah. Yeah. Are you guys doing the the buprenorphine implant here? I'm sorry, we're doing subtle pain injections. Okay, <laughs> okay, but you're doing the injections. Awesome, wonderful. That's great. That makes me happy. Um, so the patch is pretty easy to use. Um, you put it on in the morning first thing. Um, put it in a uh, a new place. Uh, pick a new place every um, once every seven days. Um, you have to use it daily, but don't use the same place if it's been used that week already. Um, the main thing is like an allergic reaction, as well as sometimes people say that, it, that because nicotine is activating that they have trouble sleeping at night. Um, and so you take off the patch in that case, but then just prepare people that they may want, um, they may have a craving for nicotine other in the morning. So to have some nicotine replacement available quickly, such as the gum and the lozenge. So um, they can uh, titrate it to manage withdrawal symptoms. Uh, in studies, it has been shown to, these two have been shown to delay weight gain. Uh, GI side effects. So this is kind of the biggest thing that people say um, is a problem and they need to. So usually people, they think it's gum, so they just keep chewing it. But if your nicotine gets into your gut, it, um, it acts on receptors in your gut and you feel nauseous. So the trick is you have to chew it until it's tingly and peppery. Uh, and then you park it in the side of your mouth for it to be for the nicotine to be absorbed by the uh, oral mucosa. So we don't want to swallow the juices because that will make us throw up. And one of the times when I did this training, um, 
one of my co-residents, uh, we brought in NRT because it was over the counter, um, and she threw up. So we had to report that as an adverse effect of our study. Um, now it's doing this thing now. The inhaler uh, is also nice because people can titrate their symptoms or titrate to manage their withdrawal symptoms. Um, it mimics the hand-to-mouth ritual of smoking, which some people, um, oops, which some uh, folks don't like because it uh, it might be reinforcing. Um, however, I have had several veterans um, be able to quit smoke, several meaning like six, um, uh, quit smoking with the inhaler um, because nothing else has worked for them and um, and they really liked having that, um, that hand to mouth uh, motion. Um, and it, it uh, some of those veterans um, that were able to quit with the inhaler, they initially came in wanting an e-cigarette uh, or to wanting to use an e-cigarette. And I said, well, you know, instead of you going out and buying an e-cigarette, how about for free, we get you the inhaler through the VA. Um, and we know that it is FDA approved and safe. The nicotine nasal spray, this one I've literally used with one patient, a veteran also. Um, because it can, it's it, like anything that goes in through the nasal mucosa, it can reach the brain faster. Um, and so it can be um, reinforcing. Plus um, the one patient that I did have use it didn't, didn't stay on it because it irritated their nose too much. Um, but it is also available, both the nasal spray and the inhaler. Generally you can do a non-formulary consult at the VA to get it. Um, and you have to, um, at most facilities, you just have to say that you've tried um, at least two other less expensive options for smoking cessation. And most of our veterans have tried at least two others. Bupropion, or also known as Wellbutrin or Zyban, is an uh, antidepressant. It works on dopamine, norepinephrine, so it reduces cravings and withdrawal. Um, it's 150 milligrams twice a day, but if somebody can't tolerate that, then 150 milligrams daily is still fine. Um, and um, it can help with uh, treating smoking even if somebody doesn't have depression. So sometimes we use it as the kill two birds with one stone sort of med, but I've added it on um, even if somebody doesn't have depression. I often do, yes. Does XL work? Yes, so you can use uh, you can use XL and SR. Um, it's just the studies. It's all like okay. you know about drug approval and stuff and money. Um, Varenicline is the newest medication that's been approved. Um, it is uh, I explain it to my Suboxone patients. So it's Suboxone for nicotine. Um, so it satisfies the receptor and it prevents you prevents them from getting the euphoria associated with smoking. Um, so uh, one of my, and it makes, it makes smoking less pleasurable. So the pleasure that comes from it, um, they don't feel. Um, and you kind of ramp up um, from days one through seven, uh, and then you get to the full dose. And um, I know one of my favorite veterans at the uh, Palo Alto VA, uh, who I literally was working on smoking cessation with him for over two years. He, uh, he came in, and he's like, Doc, I stopped taking the medication, uh, the Chantix, that, that stuff that you prescribed. And I said, why? He said, because it made my cigarettes taste nasty. And I was like, exactly, like that is exactly what it should have done. And, um, and, uh, and ultimately, um, the uh, quit rates are, are pretty good with varenicline. Um, there was, uh, many of us know, the uh, former black box warning that the Eagles trial proved, uh, showed that uh, a lot of it was hype. We also have a lot more media and a lot more ways to complain about drugs and get on there and get in those chat rooms and report to the FDA. Um, and so, um, so there's a lot of buzz around people feeling, having these neuropsychiatric adverse effects, which don't get me wrong, a lot of patients do have those. Um, I have friends who have used varenicline who have had horrible nightmares, and you know I don't doubt that they actually have those, but um, when they looked at uh, nicotine replacement versus bupropion versus varenicline, those outcomes were not significantly different across those groups. Um, so the black box warning was eventually taken off um, for neuropsychiatric adverse effects, but I still do counsel patients on that. Um, I just don't use the words black box warning anymore because it scares people. Um, all of these medications are effective. As I mentioned, varenicline is um, very effective, aside from the nasal spray, which I don't use that much. 
combinations are most effective. Um, so something long acting with something short acting is very nice um, or combining bupropion with nicotine. Um, and then if you're not prescribing um, or somebody else is prescribing or, um, or you're not a prescriber, I think it's, it's helpful to just check in about whether or not somebody is using these things. Um, and then if they need, oftentimes I find the veterans will, um, will feel hesitant to ask for a refill or contact their doctor for their nicotine replacement therapy refill um, because they feel bad about that. And so if you can be that conduit to making it easier for them to get NRT, um, it's, it's always a nice thing. So I think this might be my last slide, almost. Um, so uh, Rx for Change at UCSF.edu. There's um, a mental health curriculum. You can do this training yourself, um, uh, and uh, and also have handouts available for your patients as well as your colleagues. Um, so finally, we in this room are uh, uniquely positioned to help people quit smoking. Um, to reduce morbidity, mortality, and quality of life. Um, and so the more that we just bring it up and have it be part of our regular practice, um, the more effective we are for tobacco use disorder. That's the talk. It's like I have three minutes for questions. What about combination with phenethylamine? Mm -hmm. Can you use yeah. So that's often a question, right? Because if varenicline is working on the nicotine receptors and then you're giving more nicotine, is is there any use? So the studies have shown that there is a benefit to it. Um, uh, and, you know, although it doesn't quite make sense, um, is there some small kind of margin of nicotine coverage that the, the nicotine replacement offers? Or is it simply just that the, the patient is finding some relief from that placebo? Um, in my opinion, I don't care which, which it is. I will throw whatever I can at them to try to help them quit smoking. And anecdotally, I have had several uh, patients use both. I get a little bit of pushback from um, pharmacy sometimes um, uh, at the VA, at the Palo Alto VA, and then I would just, there is a study that I like will send them the reference to and say, and then I'll get it approved. Yeah. Um, in the Eagles trial, Yeah, I mean, so I usually, um, just because, it, so again, to get, uh, and I don't know what the approval process is here, but in the VA, uh, we have to click a little, in the Palo Alto VA, we have to click a little box saying that they've tried something else um, and before, so, the before the varenicline. Um, and so it sounds like it's not the case here, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah, so the, the efficacy is higher. Um, and uh, so should we be more likely to, or should we be using it more as a first line? Um, I think that if the system allows for it and the patient's not having to pay for it, then it makes sense. I would just, again, have a, a conversation with them about the other impacts. But yeah, I mean, I have so many people who just, I know those commercial, I have nothing to do with Pfizer, but um, you know, they have these commercials that uh, make for clean sound like a wonder drug. And, and for many patients, like when you see how quickly they're able to quit smoking and that, that it sticks, like it does feel like a wonder drug. Just like Suboxone or buprenorphine oftentimes feels like a wonder drug. Any differences between using um, like rebranicline for people that are that went from cigarettes to um, uh, like e-cigarettes or the Juul? Like I have a patient now, like I have one of those chain sticks and he's still smoking like at least one pot a day. And yeah. I also think you test my stuff. Is there anything that's more difficult about quitting that versus or treating treating that? Quitting the the e-cigarette um, with using a medication. Using a medication, I I I can't answer that um, in part because I, there's just not enough research on it, um, and uh, and I think that'll be a, a question that comes up. It's going to be hard though because where there's a lot of people who are posing e-cigarettes as this quit method. So, you know, quitting e-cigarettes versus e-cigarettes as a quit method, um, there just needs to be, there need to be better, better studies on this. 
That's a good question, though. One good news is that there's actually evidence that's been done in psychiatry residents to increase um, actual like, surveillance practice around tobacco use and like recommendations of treatment is that trainings like this actually substantially increase that. So yes, really yeah. <laughs> Yay! It's been actively studied um, as well as a pediatrician. So. Yay, so go forth and ask about tobacco. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, guys.